Uh, we're going to talk about two scriptures today, um, but the bulk of the scripture I'm going to read is in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Let me get that first. All right. Everybody there? Everybody's good? Can you turn me down a little bit, DJ? The first, the first knob? A little bit? Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Y'all can hear me good out there, though, right? All right, good. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35, the Bible says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children all that he had in the payment until the payment was made. So the servant fell on his knees and implored him, have patience with me, man, and, I, and I, will, I will pay you everything. And out of, my, out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. <clears throat> but when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay me, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went out and put that man in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. They snitched on him. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you, and in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay his debt. So also, Jesus says, my heavenly Father would do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Let's pray. Father God, we just appreciate you. We thank you, Lord. Uh, I personally thank you for giving me this opportunity to be able to, uh, to come from my heart, Father God, of, of, of what you want your people to hear about forgiveness. I know that there's people in this room who are going through egregious, and I mean immensely uh, awkward situations, Father, and they're asking for your help, and, and some things in their life they may feel is unforgivable. But I thank you, Father God, that on the cross and when you died and shared your life, you gave us the opportunity to forgive, because if you can forgive us of all of our many sins, how easy can it be for us to forgive those who sinned against us? Thank you, Father, for this time. I pray that you speak. Uh, through me, I pray that every word that I speak will be anointed and applicable to the people who's listening, Father. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. <clears throat> but before I get into this, this discussion, I want to make sure I give some level of sympathy. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's people in this room who've went through the most egregious of things. There's people in this room who've went through rape. Probably some people in this room who've been molested, people who've been divorced, people who've been cheated on. I, I guarantee there's people in this room who've gone through such immense pain. And in your mind, you may feel to yourself that these things may be unforgivable. And I understand because in this life, we have many disappointments. In this life, we go through various things and, and we live in a world full of sin. And I feel your heart and I feel it because I, when I was preparing this talk, I felt a lot of people. That's why this day has been very tough for me because I understand that when you talk about forgiveness, you're talking about the most bitterness, the deep rootness of people's hearts. And there's people in this room who's agonizing and pain and, and asking God, how can I forgive this person who done these things against me? My job this evening is to make sure that I at least paint the picture, at least be able to point you to the person that can ease those wounds and to point you to the person that can be able to help you in the process of forgiveness. But let me go right into my point. The premise from my talk is this, forgiveness is mandatory, it's not an option. Forgiveness is mandatory, it's not an option. Give me one second as I get some water. Forgiveness <clears throat> is mandatory, it's not an option. Let's look at Proverbs 10, 12. It says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offense. Let's look at these two words, these two words, hatred and love. Emotions, the thing, the book of the emotions that many of us 
have. When you look at the word, both of these emotions have a conceptual stage, a development stage, and a stage in which it produced. Many of us, we look at love at the byproduct of it, or we look at hatred based upon the byproduct. So we look at the, uh, the, 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 the uh, catastrophes that happens in the Middle East and the hatred that boils between uh, 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 countries and the hatred that boils even in racism. We look at the acts of the product, the byproduct of hatred, or we look at the, the companionship of love, and we look at the things that are tangible. But let's look a couple of stages further, and let's look at the conception of it all. The Bible says it's okay for us to be angry, but to sin not. There's people, contrary to popular belief, let me go this route, contrary to popular belief, it's okay to be angry. If you've been raped, it's okay to be angry. If you've been molested, it's okay to feel anger. If you've been cheated on, divorced, or manipulated, abused, or talked about, ridiculed, it's okay to feel that anger. God did not sit there and say for us to be as Christians that we live a life out of anger, not of not feeling no emotion. He didn't sit there and gave us these, give us these emotions for nothing. He said it's okay for you to be angry. The issue is how do we channel that anger because everything has a conceptual stage and our lives are so full of hatred and animosity and we can't forgive those people that came against us and we live a life as if like, you know what, since you did this egregious thing to my life, since you came across the boundaries and the barriers that I have in life, how sh and why should I forgive you? <laughs> have you count all the offenses that you did towards God? All the acts, the manipulations, the deceit, the lies, the things that root rots inside of your heart, and we have the audacity to say that we can't forgive the petty stuff, even if it's the most egregious of things, even if it's the most immense things, we act like we can't forgive. God is too gracious, and he created us to be people where we can forgive. And he says, you know what? I can, if you allow me into your life, give you a love that can cover all offenses because he understands how it feels. He was the one that was portrayed. He was the one that went through, through, the, through, the, through the most homeless of routes to, for his kingdom. And he went through immense pain. He was crucified, unrecognizable. So he understands what it is to be portrayed by the one he called. He understands how it feels to go through immense pain. But he still hung himself on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We got to look past the offenses and see the opportunities that even though I went through these tough things, God can turn anything around for my good if I allow him. But what we do, hatred stirs up strife in the society we live in. We are so rotten in our core because of these offenses. We are rotten in our core where we, we live this life that Satan strategically planned for us to be offended and oppressed so we can have opposition, so we can live a life where we are unforgiven, knowing that forgiveness is mandatory. There's no option. I don't care what they've done to you. I don't care what the pain that you feel. Forgiveness is not something I can sit there and choose. I may forgive her, I may forgive him, but God says if you look at how I forgave you, it makes it easy for you to forgive others. Let's look at love. All of us look at these emotions as things that we can categorize, but we fail to realize that these things have a process. A person doesn't just pop out of the womb hateful. Nobody just pops up in society bitter and rotten in their core full of hate. Hate had to begin somewhere. Now let's look at these three O's. Offend oppress and oppose, offend, oppress, and oppose. Let me make sure I cover everything in my notes. Give me one second. <clears throat> Let's keep going. Any sports fans, any NFL fans, uh, basketball fans, anybody? I know y'all NFL season's coming up. I'm a big NBA fan, college basketball fan, so excuse me skipping over your uh, love of the sport of football, but let's look at offense. Anyone who's familiar with basketball, anyone who's familiar with any type of sport as an offense and as a defense, am I correct? Offense, by definition, means to intrude, to come across a barrier, to come against a boundary. When you look at the game of sport, the offense's job is to intrude against the defense. The offense's ability, is, the offense goal is to score points against his defense. They look at, and they look at tapes to distinguish how can I penetrate this team's defense. Offenses are the same thing as an offense when it comes to sport. We all have our defenses. Many of us don't understand that we lack some areas where there's breaches. 
The whole goal behind the satanic kingdom is to cause offenses. They want to cross your barrier, whether it's your uh, psychological barrier, your physical barriers, your, your family boundaries, whatever boundaries that you have, they want to offend. So what happens with a young girl who's been raped, they cross the line and cause an offense to her life. Or someone who's been molested, it's not right for someone to cross the paths of an infant young girl, an infant young man, and molest them. So therefore, offense occurs when someone crosses a certain boundary. So the system was designed on how can I get you so offensive at your core? How can I get you so consumed with who did what to you and what they've done to you in your past? How can I get you so oppressed, deep-rooted in offenses? Because if you're easily offended, you're easily to be in a process of hatred. And if you look at your life and you look at the person who affected you back in 95 or the person who affected you last week or the person who even affected you today, you will see how offensive you really are. Their goal is to get you so offensive to the point to where they can use that offense to oppress you. And through that oppression, they want to sit there and say, how can I get into her life? How can I get into his life? Because if I can offend and cross over their barriers, if I can cross beyond the places where they are safe, if I can cross beyond the barriers of their wholesomeness and their, and their morality and their, their womanhood and their manhood, if I can cross those boundaries and cause them to be offended, I can use that to oppress them. And after I oppress them, I can have them in opposition. They'll never forgive a person, causing many people to be full, filling the corridors of hell because they are unforgiving. Who's that person you need to forgive? Who's that person that's done wrong to you? How many of us need to forgive ourselves? <laughs> How many of us, if they, I heard a quote that says, if you can penalize the person that kicked you in the behind the most, you will penalize yourself. And many of us will live a life where we're so consumed by God, man, why am I going through these trials and why are all these things happening in my life and why has everyone crossed these personal barriers of mine, these family barriers of mine, why am I so easily offended because it's by design to get you so bitter in your soul. Bitterness is one of those things that rots inside of everyone because if I can get you caught up on an incident that happened to you, I can cause you to push away someone that needs you. Because the Bible talks about before you even put your gifts up in the altar, put your gift down and go, if you have ought against your brother, go reconcile with them. Because God is not going to sit there and forgive your trespassing until you forgive others. And he's sitting there, he put that process and that principle in life because he says, you know, what, you know how much it costs for me to sacrifice my life? Do you know how much it costs for me to forgive you? Let's look at Matthew. I'm going ahead of myself. But let's go to Matthew. Let's look at this. This text here, let's really get into it, and let's break it down. Oh, but before I go there, let's talk about these boundaries. I'm sorry, I'm going ahead of myself. For those who are taking notes, let's, let's write these boundaries down. The Bible says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers offenses. And we talked about what causes hatred to boil in a person's life is deep-rooted anger. Anger that is perverted, an emotion that is perverted beyond the limits which God in, in allowed human beings to have. Many of us are angry, and it's okay to feel angry, but God says the issue comes when we sin with that anger, when we act accordingly. And many of us, we are so easily moved and so easily pressed that our anger can turn into hatred. But these things need proper boundaries. Let's talk about these five things. Give me one second. Number one, in order for me not to be hatred, hateful, in order for me not to stir strife, I have to embrace the reality. Number one, embrace reality. And what I mean by that, many of us have gone through immense pain. We've gone through a lot. It's hard to forgive that person that's done certain things to our life. It's very hard. But when we embrace the reality that it happened, because sometimes through isolation we get caught up in cloud nine and we get so caught up on woe is me. Or we get caught up on how vindicated we are and how valid we are in our statements and how we ought to feel this way and we ought to be hateful towards a person. But God says, I want you to embrace the reality. If I embrace the reality that this person has crossed me and I, and I embrace the reality of whatever happened in my past, I can move on. The issue is we don't want to embrace it. And when we don't embrace reality, we embody it. And what happens is since this altercation has happened in my life and this thing came across the barriers that I hold dear, instead of me embracing reality and sit there and say, you know what, this has happened to me. Yes, I was raped. Yes, I was molested. Yes, I was abused. Yes, I was cheated on. Yes, whatever your situation may be, embrace the reality and sit there and say, God, I'm going to embrace it and move on. Because if I don't embrace it and move on, I will embody it. And my whole life will be living out the past. 
I can't enjoy my present because I'm still living off what mama did and what daddy did and what auntie did and what uncle did and what, what society has said. And, and it's okay to feel angry. I get upset every time someone even cross my path, but I got to realize that I can't get so consumed by criticism or so consumed by what other people think or so consumed by anything that I allow it to embody me. And I can't even live my life because I'm living my life for the haters. Living my life for someone who's crossed me at a point in my life where I was infant and crossed me at a point in my life where I knew no better. If we don't embrace the reality that, yes, it did happen to me, and if I don't embrace the reality that oh, it's okay for me to move on, if I don't embrace the reality that I will live in a fairy tale land, in a land where I want this person dead or I want this person in pain or I want this situation to be removed, but God says, if you don't embrace reality, how can I navigate you through it? Because reality is real. What happened to you is tangible. It affected you emotionally. It affected you psychologically. It affected you mentally. And what happens is that anger got channeled through our lives and we embodied it so that we let it grow from the conceptual stages of anger. And yes, I should be angry. And yes, I should be upset. But I allow my mind to sin and I allow my actions to sin. And I begin to live a life where I hate the person and I'm bitter against the person or I'm bitter against myself. And what happens is I don't embrace the reality and go on to God and say, God, this is real. This really happened to me and I need your help. Number two. After I embrace reality, I avoid isolation. The system demonically was designed to isolate you. The moment that you live a life in a fairy tale land of being a victim, always thinking that you're a victim, always accusing everyone else, and you never embrace the reality, what happens is you'll be your own spokesman. And you will isolate yourself because they love to get you in a corner where you don't have no help. Because they put you in a, in a refrigerator that's not plugged in, everything inside of it will rot. And since you have no source and you have nothing to connect to and you have no group of people to connect to, everything inside of yourself begins to rot. Because they understand if there's no source, if there's no energy, if there's nothing in this person's life to keep them sustained and to keep them with hope in their life and let them know that God can turn anything for evil into good. If this person don't realize the realities of what happened and God was the omniscient one that oversaw it all and wove his plan within even the molestation, the rape and the abuse, woven his plan even in the altercation, the ridicule, woven his plans and everything that was bad in your life. And you'll be a person that slowly drifts into isolation. The thoughts of torment. There's people in the Middle East that just hate people for no reason. There's people even in the church that hate each other for no reason. There's people that's incubating inside these corridors of immense hatred to the point to where they wished above all that their enemies and their haters were dead. And they wished above all, maybe it's not their degree, but they just wish they can be beyond them. So you're on Facebook comparing your life to your, to your, your co uh, competition and you're comparing your life to how they're living because you want them to feel the pain they made you feel. Are you isolated? Are you not embracing the reality? Because anytime someone does not check them like their lives and say, you know what, I'm going to embrace this, not embody it, embrace it and move on. After I embrace it and I make sure I avoid isolation, the next thing I do is seek the right team, seek the right people, accountability. If you isolate it, you won't have no accountability. Accountability, by definition, is giving someone the ability to account for your life. That's what accountants are. They hold the business accountable to the money that comes in. If I live in a life where I don't embrace reality, I live in a fairy tale land. If I live in a fairy tale land, I'll probably be isolated because nobody wants to deal with you. And since nobody wants to deal with you, all of a sudden you won't have the right perspective or you'll be a person that's so, so, what's my, what's my third point? Don't have nobody around them. And from there, let's keep going, let's keep going, because I, I got to get to somewhere in this scripture I want to get to. Number one, embrace reality. Number two, avoid isolation. Number three, seek the right team. And number four, search for a clear understanding. What does that mean? <laughs> when you're in the middle of a storm, and you're in the middle of pain, it's hard to grasp understanding. <laughs> I look back in my life and all the stuff that I went through as an individual, all the negative situations that I went through in my life, 
When I was going through it, I didn't know what to do. When I was going through the situations in my life, I didn't understand what was going on. I thought I was in sin. I thought I was in all these issues. But come to find out those were the building blocks by which I can stand as a man today. That the character of an individual is not relevant or the character of an individual is not evident when you go through comfort. Anybody who's going through comfort, your character's not tested. How can I know who you really are? I can't, I can't give you time to grow. I can't determine if you're mature unless you go through some pain. And so we get in this Christianity and sit there and say, well, God, I don't want to go through no pain. I don't want to go through no situations. But God says, if you don't have no pain, where's the progress? If there's no pain, how can I get you to tap into your full potential? But what we do is we want this faith where everything is so red carpet and everything is so plush and everything is so well for me to the point that we become immature. And how many people in the church? Or how many people in life are so immature because they don't want to even let anything sharpen them? <laughs> anything that's not sharp, it always ends up dull. Look at your life and find out how sharp you really are. Are you a person that's progressing day by day? Are you a person that's allowing yourself to heal day by day? Because if you don't sit there and seek God with all of your heart and say, God, I may not understand what it is that I'm going through. I may not understand what I have been through. But God, if I seek you close enough, you'll give me the clear understanding of why. That's why when you're in the middle of a storm, you don't know why. That's why instead of going by my clear view of this, I got to go to someone who has a peripheral view of my life, who can say, Josh, the reason why this happened in your life and the reason why this happened in your life is for your good. And that person may have crossed you. It's funny. The Bible says if they would have known what they was doing, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. If the people who did whatever to you knew what they was doing, they probably wouldn't do it. But since they didn't know, God allowed that to happen in your life for it to happen in your life. And now I feel bad for every person who talks about me, cheated on me. Anything that happened in my life because they don't even know what they was doing. They didn't make me worse. They made me better. And when you look at life based upon what people do to you and you say, you making me better. But when you get so consumed by what they've done for you, you actually get dull and you actually get worse in the process. But when you're a man of faith or a woman of faith and you look at your life and say, despite what they do to me, despite what goes on, for God forgive them for they knew not what they do because if they did know, if they knew how you was going to prepare a table in the presence before them, how if they don't really knew how stupid they're going to feel that they crossed this boy, then they probably wouldn't have done it. There's going to be a lot of people upset with your boy in these next few weeks, months. There's going to be people who's going to be very upset with you in your life because nobody wants to see you progress. That's why Satan loves to get into your mind through his demonic system to get you so consumed in your bitterness and so consumed in your hatred that you never progress when God is sitting there saying, I allowed it to happen for your good. When you understand that God allowed it for your good, that God wasn't off there in Japan and God went off there on Pluto chilling, playing golf, whatever he was doing, God was in your life the whole time quiet. Reminds me of what KJ said. The teacher never talks when the test happens. God gave, made aware to me this week one of the most profound things I heard him say to me in a while. He said, Josh, don't worry about what you're going through right now. He says, when a kid has to go from fifth grade to sixth grade, from elementary to middle school, all the little tests that he did in fourth grade, little tests he did in fifth, doesn't compare to the end of grade testing. It doesn't compare. The hardest test comes at the end of your, le your, your level. When you're going through immense pain, you're probably about to jump over to the next level. Nobody from fifth to sixth or from eighth to ninth or from twelfth to college goes through life breezy. You have to go through various of tests that becomes hard. The test you want everything that you've learned in this process. And if you don't have a clear understanding of who God is and his character, you'll find yourself failing test after test after test after test and never progressing. I refuse when a test of life come to fail. And I went through all this hell. For all these years, and now I'm going to fail the test. I'm saying, God, you know what? If I'm going through this pain, if I'm going through all these different things in my life, then I must be passing the test. And when you're going through all this immense pain and pressure, anxiety, and stress, maybe God is trying to birth you into a new process, a new system, a new place. But when you run from it, you don't pass. Because when I have a clear understanding. After I embrace reality, avoid isolation, Seek the right people around me to keep me accountable. 
Search for the clear understanding. I got to maintain that right perspective. Number five, I got to maintain that right perspective. Perception is everything. Jesus didn't, if, if, if God was, where would we be today if God never came and saved us? What if God was a God who harbored all of our offenses? What if he was a God to sit there and say, you know, I ain't going to come down for them. But his perception of us was not based upon our sins. His perception of us was based upon our purpose and our potential. He said if a, if a grain falls and dies, and when, when a person and myself as God, if I come down in life and die for these people, I'm not dying for all of humanity, which my goal is that I wish above all that all men to be saved. Yes, that's his goal. But he says, I'm not going to allow myself to be so offended by what mankind has done that I won't come down to earth for all the people that would accept me. And what happens is when you have a right perception, a right perspective, you can look at your past and say, you know what, that was for my good. And what happened in my past actually making me who I am now. So when that person who whatever cheated on you, whatever went through in your life shows up in your face, it can be like water off a duck's back and it won't affect you. Because you'll look at them and say, thank you. Because if it wasn't for you, I would not be who I am today. And I forgive you because I have the right perspective. <laughs> We like to imprison the people that hurt us the most. Not knowing that the Bible says when a person comes against you and you give them kindness and he coals a fire on their head, you know what that means? It doesn't mean they're going to burn his head off. But if you treat your enemies right, if you treat those that despitefully use you, it will renew their mind. And the reason why the people who have gone against you, minds are not renewed, because you're not giving a level of kindness. And many people say, fake it till you make it, but you got to do what you got to do. Because if you truly got a relationship with God and you truly experience forgiveness, and the reason why people can't forgive because they truly haven't experienced forgiveness. I was 19. Me and my father, I didn't really like my father. Love him now. I really didn't like a lot of people that came against me. I was a very bitter individual. And it wasn't my dad's fault. It was my wrong perception of him. It wasn't the people's fault. Whatever happened in my life, they just didn't know what they was doing. But I was in Oral Roberts University and I was sitting in my dorm room. God broke me. And he began to picture in my mind all the offenses that I did to him. My heart became burdened. And I began to see Christ on the cross. And I began to see what, what, what I contributed to that death. And when I began to look at what I've done and I looked at my life and say, man, how could I get upset about people who may have wronged me when I've done this to God over and over and over again? And when that became real in my life, man, I had to forgive. Because he forgave me. Out of all the incidents that I've done, out of all the people and the girls that I've hurt, out of all the lies that I've told, out of all the negligence of my time and my money that I've done towards God, and when he told me to write these books, I only wrote one because I procrastinated and I, and I, and I, and I, and I hindered his progression in my life. I don't got time to worry about what people done to me. I'm gonna, I don't got to worry about the people that want to talk about me and use me and, and get me so consumed in bitterness that I can't forgive. Why should I get consumed by that when I'm so in awe of the fact of a God who can forgive me despite all my flaws? And when that becomes real and you experience that level of forgiveness, you know, it would be a love inside that covers all offenses. Let's look at Matthew. Matthew 18, y'all all right? Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Jesus was chilling, man. He just already just kind of made the Pharisees even more upset. And then your boy Peter comes up and say, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. So your boy Peter, <laughs> cool dude, man. You can't hate on his, 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 his uh, motivation. The man was just trying to do well. See, in the Jewish customs, the custom back in that day that the Pharisees established through the law of Moses, or what Moses established was that it's okay that if you could, you could forgive a person three times, and that's it. So there's, there's three levels of, of our understanding of forgiveness. That's the, the traditional view of forgiveness, our personal view of forgiveness, and the original view of forgiveness. Let's look at the Jewish view of forgiveness. Back in the Jewish custom, it's okay to go three times. And many of us, through our accountability, through our moms and our aunts and our fathers and whatnot, they may articulate through their influence that it's okay, just do this 
do this like this and get over it. But three times can't affect the inner wounds that we have. How can I forgive a person three times? The significant the wound, the longer it takes to heal. And so Peter was like, man, can I do it seven times? And what Peter was trying to say, you know, I'm trying to be a good boy. I'm trying to get good credit. I'm trying to get, tell Jesus to give me some type of brownie points. I'm trying to say, well, can I forgive him seven times? Jesus said, no. Unlimited. I want you to think in your life that the person who hurted you the most, look inside your heart and look at the person that caused you the most pain. And from the Savior's mouth, he says, forgive them unlimited. 70 times 7. Hmm. You feel that emotion? How can I forgive the unforgivable? How can I forgive the pain? Some people who's hurt you is dead and gone. Someone who hurt you is in your house. But Jesus said, you know what? I say, not what tradition says, not what you think. I say forgive them unlimited. Let's look. Let's look at this some more. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus began to tell a parable because Peter was like, dang, cuz. And he began to tell a parable, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle one, one when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had. Back in those days, if you owed a player some money, your whole family suffered for it. And he began to continue on. So he sold with his wife and children all that he had and payment to, until a payment was made. So the servant fell on his knees. Have patience on me. I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him that debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred dollars. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Same thing he said to his master. He refused and went out and put him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. Man, how can you not forgive him? But anyway, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servants as I had mercy on you? And his anger, and in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly father would do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, what does that parable mean? 10,000 denarii was equivalent to $6 billion. And a hyperbole, Jesus is always talking hyperbole, it means an exaggerated statement. He says it was a debt that he would not be able to pay even if he was Bill Gates. He does not impossible for him to pay $6 billion. And God, through this master, said, I wiped your debt. See, we don't understand. We get so caught up in the love of God. Now, God is a God of love, and, but we forget that God is a God of wrath. And I'm not sitting there wrath based upon I'm just going to snipe and just kill everybody. See, we want God to be fair. I heard of Stephen A. Smith from, from a First Take said, fair is where pigs are. If you really wanted God to be fair, <laughs> you want God to be fair, all of us would be in hell right now. See, God's not a God by fairness. He's a God of just this. He says, I'm not going to put you in hell because by law, in fairness, I could eliminate everybody. That's why people get mad at God. Why did God kill thousands of people in the Old Testament? God was a just God. If any man is in sin, he can strike judgment on anybody anytime. He don't got to sweat his brow for nothing. He's a just God. And what we get so consumed by, God is a God of love, and so his love will help us to, to cope with all these different things, and it is true, but we forget that God is a God of wrath, and this king who went to go sell accounts with his servant is like God, who's coming before you and sitting there saying, let me sell an account for you. And he looked at your life and saw your imperfections and said, you are incapable enough of your own strength to pay the debt. So through repentance, you hear the servant saying, I plead with you, God. I plead with you, Master. I can't pay no $6 billion debt. I can't pay this. So we plead before God repentance, but we have the audacity from a person who we owe an, account, an uncalculated amount of $6 billion to, but we go to all these people who only did a little petty stuff to us. 
And we put them in prison and we, we, we have all this hatred towards them and, and the love of God cannot cover those offenses and the love of God cannot renew their mind for their salvation. What about the person who wronged you the most? Do you wish for their salvation? Do you wish for their wellness? Pair of Proverbs says when, you're per when your enemy's hungry, give them something to eat. When your enemies are thirsty, give them something to drink. But we live in a culture where, nah, bro, nah, nah. You did this to me. If you looked at how much you owe God, but he gave his life for the price through his son, Jesus, a debt that we couldn't even pay, even if we was rich upon rich, but we have the audacity to imprison people. They said a thousand denarii was only like a petty cash. It wasn't that much. Who are those people that we are bitter toward? Those people that through the offenses, through crossing of those boundaries and crossing those barriers that we allow this demonic influence to oppress us, that we are in opposition. And we allow anger, which is good and is good for us to have. It's okay for us to be angry. The Bible says be angry and sin not. It's okay for me to embody anger. You should be angry if you've been molested. You should be angry if you've been raped. You should be angry if you went through tough things. But God says instead of channeling that anger towards bitterness, channeling it to producing something to help other people who went through what you've been through, let that anger lead you to do something for humanity. Instead of become self-centered for yourself. Because if you let that thing rot inside of you, you may pay your tithes, you may go to church, you may be faithful to God, but God may sit there and say, I don't know you. Because you treated my forgiveness like it's nothing. Even the unforgivable can be forgiven. It all determines by how I look at it. And when I look at my life and I say, God, you've been so gracious to me. I can look past anybody who's wronged me now, who's wronging me in the future. I can look past it. It may affect me, and it will. I'm not trying to be unrealistic to make you believe that you won't feel some type of pain. Yes, you're going to feel it. But if you have a genuine relationship with God and you have a deep burden and passion for him, then when you look at these situations, it won't be nothing, and you can actually forgive. Now, am I expecting you to forgive something that traumatized you in your life immediately? No. That's why Jesus said, I can be with you even to the end. I will help you to forgive. My grace is sufficient. And God's not sitting there saying, dang, if I die today and I don't forgive this person, I'm going to hell. But God says, if your heart is willing, may not be able now, but if your heart is willing to forgive, then that's okay with him because he will walk you to the point where you can look at that person over time and say, you know what? I love you. Do you love your enemies? Do you love those who oppress you? But it's going to come a time. I mean, I remember he reading books and stories about the early church. Stephen was getting stoned. For what? He said, God forgive them. To the people who stoned them. People who was walking to the guillotines and the people who was being burnt were singing praises. And they would say, even historians will write in his historic books that they would sit there forgiving Caesar, trying to forgive. God forgive them, for they knew not what they do. Are we at that place where God is the center of our lives and that we realize our faults towards him, not in to be in a place where we're so consumed, like, dang, I wronged God. But what I'm saying is, by your grace, you forgave me. Then when that person who wronged me come in my life, I can forgive them. Because it cannot compare to the debt that I owe him. What are those things in your life that you're allowing yourself to be bitter towards? Who are those people in your life that you need to forgive? Who are those people in your life that you wished above all that they wasn't even living? <laughs> what are those situations that you have done that you can't even forgive yourself? Many of us are trapped in our own prisons where we can't even forgive ourselves because we wronged ourselves. We, we went to school at the wrong time. We didn't finish school or we, we messed up the relationship or you cheated on the girl or you messed up on your wife and now you incubating in your own wrongdoing. Don't, don't victimize yourself in isolation because God says, you know what, I don't even care if you wronged somebody. I can still help you. So even if you look in your heart and you feel as if, man, I'm the culprit, Josh, when was the last time you forgave yourself? That was your past. Just because you wasn't faithful back then doesn't mean you can't be faithful now. Just because you was bad with these situations in the past doesn't mean that you can't be renewed because all things are made new. 
for those who believe. Let's pray. And then KJ will be coming up. Father God, we just appreciate you. I wasn't able to go through everything that I wanted to go through in my notes, but I pray they felt my heart. That there are some issues that we have to deal with, Father, and there's a lot of things in our heart that we have to deal with. And many of us are addicted to things, and many of us are consumed with things because, Father, we haven't forgiven ourselves. And we're upset with certain people right now, Father God, because of what they've done to us. And through offense and through oppression, we become in opposition towards everyone who's ever wronged us. But God, you created us to be people that beyond our afflictions, that we can see the potential of others. And beyond the afflictions and beyond the pain, we can forgive. And Father God, forgiveness is tough. It's hard. But we're thankful, God, that you are able to help us through the process. That even if we're not willing to forgive now, we don't feel like we can. We know that through your Holy Spirit and his regenerating work, we can. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.